But the first scripture I'll read is in John 3. Um, I've been uh, reading this little booklet here. And some of you have seen it. I've made a couple copies of it. I think Adam's got one, James and Sharon. I don't know if any if you guys have read through much of it or not yet. Uh, great little book here. Uh, it's by B.H. Clendenin. And I know his name goes around a lot in the church. But he preached and taught some of the most powerful preaching and teaching that I've ever heard. You know, uh, he preached a message in in 1982 called "Soldiers," and uh, if you've not heard that message, you need to look that up. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, and I tell you, if it don't stir you, you're not stirrable. It is, in my opinion, at least. But one little paragraph out of this book, he asks a uh, a fairly long question, I guess several parts in it. Uh, the, the heading over this little paragraph is, is what about you? And it says, what have you done with your born again experience? What have you done with your baptism in the Spirit? What have you done with your life since God healed your broken body? What have you done with the exceeding great and precious promises of God? What have you done for a world ripening for the harvest? What about the 1.5 billion souls who have never heard the name of Christ? The whole world is waiting for the demonstration of the kingdom of God. So that one small paragraph out of this little book uh, is very, very powerful there. If you'll just look at that one paragraph, uh, really dig into these these questions that it's asked. Uh, it's I'm telling you, it should make you want to examine your life. Uh, that first, the first verse that I'll read here out of the Bible is, is John three three. Uh, he says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, uh, the last part of Clendenin's question here, he says that the whole world is waiting for the demonstration of the kingdom of God. Well, uh, we've got. Uh, see, there's, there's not much teaching and preaching in the church that, that really deals with the specifics of all this. Uh, and so what we end up with is a, a church full of people, and all of them has a different idea about the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Well, uh, most of us here tonight are, is probably thinking about heaven. You know, heaven as being the kingdom of God. Uh, but that's not the kingdom of God, folks. I mean, I guess that's part of His kingdom, but that's not the kingdom. Uh, so he, he says there that the, the whole world is waiting for the demonstration of the kingdom of God. Uh, and then in John 3.3 3 here, he tells them there that except a man be born again, uh, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So right off the bat, we begin to get a, a little bit of a hint here uh, that with a, a true born again experience that we may begin to see uh, the kingdom of God. Right here on this earth, see, uh, there should be a kingdom of God set up on this earth. And I'm not talking about a certain place. Uh, as a matter of fact, it should cover the whole world and, and be scattered all throughout the world here uh, as the kingdom of God here. But he goes on several different places that it mentions the kingdom of God. Uh, in Ephesians 5.5, 5, he says, For this ye know uh, that whore, no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man uh, who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Uh, well, we know that, that, you know, we've talked a lot about that verse here lately, 1 John 5.4, that says, uh, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Uh, we know tonight that uh, a true... Somebody who's truly been born again, there's going to be a change in them. Uh, and we preached here uh, Sunday night about keeping that free man free here. And uh, Paul said, "Who shall deliver us from this body of death?" Uh, and and we we covered that a little bit how that he was talking about uh, the punishment of the Romans there, where they would actually tie a dead body to you, uh, and you would carry that dead body and, until the the stench and the disease and the corruption uh, from that dead body actually killed you also. Well, uh, we see that 
Uh, in the Scriptures here, we can see kind of examples of that. Uh, we see an example of that uh, when the Bible talks about the dying of the old man, the, the burial, the resurrection, course of a new man, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, we see example after example of that throughout the Scriptures uh, where the, this, this body of death, this old man is supposed to die, uh, but he's not only supposed to die, he's supposed to be severed uh, from that new living creature. Now Christ said, He said, I'm a quicken his spirit. Uh, and what that means tonight is that he's going to bring life. Uh, he says, I've come to bring life and life more abundantly. That's, I mean, that was his whole purpose. Uh, but how does he bring life to something that's already alive? Well, he brings a new kind of life. Uh, and, and I know you guys are sick of it probably, but every time I get to talking about this, I think about that man uh, who sat in that motel room up there in McKee. And uh, this man, maybe some of you have not heard it. God puts it on my heart for some reason. But this man, uh, he was sitting there in a motel room and uh, and just in my key, if you can imagine this, uh, and his wife had run him out of his home. He had nothing, folks, except for the truck uh, that he was driving outside and what clothes he could carry in that truck, just in that little motel room. Uh, and, and me and Brother Bernard Thomas went in there to talk with him that night trying to witness to him uh, and invited him to church and all this. And, and a lot of times we sell God short by just inviting people to church. You see, uh, our witness should be much more than, hey, why don't you come down to church on Sunday? Uh, our witness should be much greater than that outside the church. We should convict people uh, when we're outside of the church. And I don't mean, I'm not saying condemn now, I'm saying convict. And there's a huge difference. Uh, we should convict people because they should see something in us that they actually want to have. Uh, lots of Christians tonight, you know, I say this a lot, but you look at them, uh, they got a face longer than a mule, folks. I mean, they're miserable, they're bitter, they're sad, they're all this kind of stuff. They don't know the joy of God, and yet they claim to, to know God. And I don't know tonight that we can fully know God without knowing the joy of God also. He said uh, that He would give us joy. I mean, that is one of the very fruits of the Spirit tonight. Uh, is joy. It looks like we're going to preach, I guess, tonight. But uh, He says... Uh, uh, but this man in the motel room, he says, you know, uh, when we invited him to church, he said, you know, Sunday's just been another day to me all my life. I've never went to church. He said, I've worked seven days a week. And he, he began to tell me all the things that he had had. Uh, he said, I've bought farms and tractors and bulldozers and trucks. And uh, he began to name all this kind of stuff. And I'm telling you, it was a great big list of things that he had had. Uh, but as he sat that moment, all he had uh, was a pickup truck and a few clothes in the dresser drawer of a smoky motel room uh, in McKee. And I just sat there and I let him finish all that he had to say. Uh, and it's just like God spoke to me and gave me a word for him there. I said, you've never been satisfied though, have you? Uh, and he dropped his head and tears began to run down his cheeks. And he said, I've never been satisfied. And I said, that's because it's part of you that's dead. It's never been brought to life, you see. Now, that part is actually born dead in us and must be brought to life by a uh, quickening spirit, which is Christ of course. Uh, but he tells us there that, that none of these people who, who have not overcome the world is going to go. Now, folks, that's because they've never been saved to begin with. Or that's my belief. Now, 1 Corinthians 6.10, he, he goes in, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, uh, 1 Corinthians 15.50, he says, Now this I say, brethren, uh, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Well, uh, I'm telling you, folks, I mean, he goes into a great big list of things. I, I cut out a lot of Scripture here tonight uh, talking about all the things that will not inherit uh, this kingdom of God. Now, I'm laying a foundation here tonight. You guys are looking at me kind of funny. Uh, I'm, I'm going somewhere. Uh, none of these things can inherit kingdom of God. And then in this, this verse here that I just read, 1 Corinthians 15, 50, uh, he says that flesh and blood cannot inherit this kingdom. Oh, uh, well, you see lots of people out here, and you see this in the churches. I mean, it's, it's rampant in the churches. Uh, people who are trying to serve God out of the flesh, uh, out of what they know to do. Well, uh, you know, it, it's time to do this. It's time to do that. That's what's on our schedule. That's what we got to do. Uh, you know, tonight we 
walk in here, there are not many people here. I, trust me, you can have church with this number tonight. Now, if you couldn't, we'd have had to wait six or eight months to ever have the first service after we started coming down here uh, because there wasn't seven or eight people here when we started, folks. I, I mean, I know you can have church like this uh, if everybody would get into one mind and one accord here for God now. Uh, lots of people in one mind and one accord, but they're wanting to go home. I'm talking about for God. I'm talking about get our minds fixed on the Lord tonight uh, and all that He's done for for us and the price that He's paid for us, uh, get our mind fixed on God tonight. Uh, listen, He tells us, none of these things are going to inherit. Flesh and blood cannot inherit. Uh, if we're serving in our flesh tonight, if we're serving out of this mind, uh, this mind is carnal, folks. This mind is... Uh, God don't save the mind, in case you didn't know that tonight. He saves the soul. Uh, our mind is always carnal. It's always fleshly. That's why we must serve and be led by God. Uh, and, and we can't serve out of the flesh and, and blood tonight. The, the flesh portion of us. You know, lots of people... Uh, they got the itinerary, they got the schedule, they got the program. Uh, they'll hand it to you as you come in the door. Uh, Sister Bertha's going to sing uh, uh, this song. Uh, you know, Brother So and So will sing this song. Uh, uh, this will last 28 minutes. Uh, after that, the pastor will get up. Here's the scripture that he's going to read. Uh, here's the outline of his message. Uh, all this kind of stuff. At 12 o'clock, you will be on your way out the door. Uh, all that kind of stuff. Folks, there's people serving like that all over this country. Country, uh, there's preacher after preacher uh, preaching nothing but worldly gain tonight. Uh, that is nothing tonight except for the flesh uh, trying to serve God. I'm telling you, uh, God never promised you a bed of roses. Uh, he never promised you a pocket full of money, any of those things. Uh, some man said, talking about a TV preacher, uh, he said that he went down and uh, he cast the spirit of poverty out of somebody. Uh, he said if that was the truth, uh, there was an evil spirit in Christ Himself because He walked in poverty, folks. I'm telling you, uh, listen, it, it, you know we're going to go. Uh, the Bible says that we'll press into this kingdom through tribulation. That's one of the, the verses on the uh, kingdom of God that I didn't write down here tonight or didn't paste on here. It uh, talks about we'll press in through tribulation. Tribulation. Now, I'm telling you, if I go home and plop down in a bed of roses and ride my limo down here and all that, I'm not saying there's anything wrong uh, with having stuff tonight. I'm just telling you, God don't promise you all these things, folks. Listen, God don't... Uh, I'll give you another clean den. He says God don't make you happy uh, by giving you things. God makes you happy by giving you Himself. That's what should make you happy tonight, when God gives you of Himself. He says in Luke 9.27, He says, But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. I'm trying to prove to you tonight that the kingdom of God is not just up in heaven. The kingdom of God is, is here tonight, folks. In this building is the kingdom of God. Not just some faraway place, you know? Not through some gates of pearl somewhere or something like that. You know, we walk around down here uh, defeated all the time, not understanding that we should be walking in the kingdom of God. Uh, it's like we talked about down here the other day. You know, I preached this at Bark Road uh, a while back. Uh, he says that, that the yoke will be broken by the anointing. Uh, and when we talked about this over there, I said, you, you find an old hound dog or something somewhere where he's been tied uh, for a long time and he's got the ground just wore out where he's drug that chain around or whatever. Uh, and you ease over there and, and you unsnap that chain and just lay it down on the ground quietly so that he don't know it. Uh, and that dog will stand there in that place. He'll never go outside the bounds uh, of where he's wore that ground out. He'll never move out of that place, folks, because he thinks uh, that he's still in bondage. He could be running free, uh, doing everything that he's got the power to do, folks. We could be doing so much more tonight uh, than what we have done. We could be seeing uh, so many works of God than what we have seen tonight. Uh, if we would get out of this bondage mindset, you see, uh, we prayed so many prayers. It's not come true that we think the next one won't either. Listen, uh, maybe we just wasn't where we needed to be. Maybe it wasn't God's will. Uh, maybe we lacked the discernment tonight to tell the difference. But I'm telling us... Uh, 
by everyone here tonight, including me, that if we press harder and we get closer, we come more into the fellowship of God, we become more pleasing in His sight. Listen, we gain favor with God, and before long we'll begin to lay hands on the sick and see them healed. Before long we'll see our loved ones saved, all these kinds of things. But I'm telling you tonight, listen, there's so much more. And He tells them right there that there's some there, some back then, 2,000 years ago, that would not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. I'm telling you tonight, we should be seeing the kingdom of God. But what should have happened... Now, let me just... Lee thinks he's hateful. I'll tell you what should have happened tonight. As time went on, this kingdom should have grown stronger and stronger and stronger all the time. If people 2,000 years ago could see the dead raised, we ought to be able to walk into a cemetery somewhere and see them all come out. Folks, I'm telling you, we should have more power today than they had then. But because we've compromised, because we've turned our back on all that God's told us to do, because other things and unbelief have entered in and taken the place of the things of God, uh, we, we're in a weak church now, folks. I'm not talking about Red Lick. I'm talking about uh, all across this land and world tonight. Uh, we serve uh, in a church that has no power. Uh, we lay hands on sick that don't recover. Uh, we pray for lost that don't get saved. Has God fell short tonight? Has He grown weak? Uh, absolutely not, folks. It is the church tonight. Now, I know I preach to the church all the time, but who's here tonight but the church? Uh, you want to see me preach to lost people? Drag them in here, kick and screaming. I'll preach to them to, to my heart's content, folks. Uh, but as long as it's the church, the message will go to the church. And what we need to do now to see this kingdom come into effect tonight. Amen? Amen. He says in Mark 16, 15, He says, and He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. Go into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. Well, it asks in that book, what about the 1.5 billion souls that have never heard the name of Christ? What about them? What have we done? Sent $300 to Josh Hamby. You know? <laughs> Woo! Amen. We're making a difference in the world. You know? Listen, brother, I put five dollars in there. I'm making a worldwide difference. Oh, you are. I mean, I won't take away from you five dollars or whatever you put in. But what if you was one of those 1.5 billion that had never even heard of Christ? Never even have been given an opportunity, folks then how valuable would this work be all throughout the world? You say, I can't get throughout the world. I don't have the capacity to go where people have never heard the name of Christ. Don't lie to me, folks. Don't lie to me and don't lie to God. You don't have the ability to walk up the, and down the road in your neighborhood. You say, everybody in my neighborhood already knows. Don't take that for granted tonight. I went to school, you know, of course, up in Jackson County there. And you think everybody knows. We was in high school. And there was a boy there that I had known. I didn't know him well, just known him all throughout my life, which I was lost anyway. You know, I didn't know up from down. But somebody came to me and said, this boy has never seen a Bible in his life. I'm going to bring him one, they said. I was like, he's never seen a Bible. They said he has never seen a Bible in his life. He lived within two miles of where I live right now. And had never seen a Bible in all his life, folks. You talk about a people that's ripe for picking, folks. You talk about a people that would, that would love to know 
They might be on your street. You know, you might not have to go to Indonesia, Lee. You know, you might have to just walk down your street. You know, when you get all of them, hey, walk to the next street over. Go somewhere else. You know, I don't know. Like I said, the, the outreach has been on my mind lately. We've got to start going outside uh, these walls and doing a work. I know we've needed to stay in. I know that we've needed to, to soak up all the teaching and preaching, all the strengthening, all the feeding, all that God has done for us. I know that we have needed that so bad. Uh, but listen, I'm telling you, it's time we go outside the walls. It's time we organize something. Uh, we start an outreach. We start helping people some. Somehow, uh, even if it's just presenting the gospel to them, even if it's uh, going to a Dollar Tree somewhere, folks, and buying a stack of Dollar Bibles uh, and handing them out to people that don't have them. Listen, uh, we can do more than we've been doing, but we don't. Uh, and that's why we don't see the kingdom of God like we should. Uh, oh, listen, uh, everybody's got excuse. Everybody's got reasons. Uh, it's so hard. i, I got all these problems, all this kind of stuff. Uh, listen, how many many of you tonight, and me included, now how many of you tonight lose our tempers, you know, hit the old thumb with a hammer and uh, you throw that thing over the hill or something like that, have to go find it later, you know, you can't drive a nail without it, uh, whatever it is, but just it don't take nothing to discourage us and beset us, it don't take anything till we're ready to cuss somebody out, uh, chew them out, tell them what a bad day we've had, something like that. Uh, if you remember just a little while back, I, I showed the church a picture uh, of a, di a dying church child, folks. He was he was trying to crawl uh, to a place to find food and a big vulture sitting there waiting on that child to die. Uh, listen, you think you got problems tonight. Uh, you've just not seen the rest of the world, folks. I mean, uh, we need to be doing more than we've ever done before. And, and to be honest, the church probably does less today than it's ever done throughout the history of this world. Amen. Throughout the history of the church. Amen. It's so hard. Oh, I got so much going on. Listen to this. In Acts 16.23, he says, And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Paul and Silas. They're in prison. All right, let me just be clear about this. They are having a bad day, okay? At least by our standards, they're having a rough day, all right? They you know, they've been cast into prison. And it's not like the jails that we got, folks. I've been in the jails that we got. Uh, you go down there, uh, they're sitting there in our air-conditioned room watching television and, and, and being fed good and all that kind of stuff. Uh, these men were not put into uh, a jail like we have. They was thrown into a place with rock walls, probably straw on the floor, probably filthy, chained their feet in stocks. They was having a bad day, all right? It goes on, but it says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Well, I praise God tonight. I don't know if that hits anybody here tonight, but listen. Uh, when they was put in that prison and put in stocks and all this, uh, it says that they sing, uh, they prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Well, uh, we, we look out, listen, we've talked a lot about it in this church, how that everybody's in bondage to something. Uh, it's drugs, it's alcohol, it's pornography, it's whatever it is. Uh, lots of different things. The devil's got all kinds of bondage tonight. Uh, we can see it tonight. We can recognize it tonight. We can talk to each other about it tonight. Uh, but what are we doing that the prisoners might hear us uh, preach God to them and sing praises unto God? Uh, what are we doing tonight to show them a kingdom that they could have also? Uh, what are we doing tonight to show them uh, that there is deliverance for whatever kind of a bondage that there is in. Listen, uh, you know, I said here a while, a while back, what kind of people are we uh, if we come into the church house and, and preach and sing and shout and dance uh, while the world dies lost and us with the answer to every question they've got and won't tell them, folks? What, what kind of, what would we be if we was on a ship and somebody was uh, out in the water sinking and we wouldn't throw the life preserver, folks, would we not be murderers? Do you know that one of the works of the flesh is murder? 
If we let people die a death and spend eternity separated from God, are we any better than a murderer? Are you guys getting hold of this? The prisoners heard them, folks. What are we doing? When the prisoners walk by, we turn our back and whisper to each other. You know? Oh. You know, you're down at work having a good conversation about the Lord. Oh, there comes a lost man. The weather sure is nice, ain't it? Yeah, yeah, the weather's nice. I'm glad we're getting this rain. The lost man gets on by, and we say, but anyway, three got saved down there Sunday. Praise the Lord. You know, is it? Is that not what people do, folks? I mean, you know I'm telling you the truth. Is that not what we do? Listen. And suddenly there was an earthquake and the foundation of the prison was shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the, the keeper of the prison walked out of his woke out of his sleep. And seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Uh, but Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas uh, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? All right? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and all that were in his house, and to all that were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into the house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Well, here's the, here's the question tonight. Is, is what difference are we making? Anybody know about John Wesley? John Wesley, I didn't know this till Josh Hamby said it down here the other night. John Wesley had a horrible wife. Horrible. I mean, they hated each other. One man walked into their house and she's dragging him around the house by the hair of his head, folks. Now, I read up on this some after I heard Josh talking about that. And Sharon's looking over here to see if Roseanne's over there. Uh, if John Wesley could make the difference that he made with a horrible wife, I should have been around the world ten times by now with a wife that supports me. You know? You, you guys don't tell her I said that. Her head will swell off. No. Listen, John Wesley though, he had a horrible wife. And I was reading up some after after I heard Josh say that. I was reading the history of it and stuff. And some of the letters that John Wesley had wrote to his wife, and one of them said, what difference would it make to any person in this world if you died right now? <laughs> now, this is the kind of love they had, you know. What difference would it make if you died now? Well... That's incredibly harsh tonight, I know. But ask yourself that question tonight. What difference would it make to anybody? I know your family would miss you, stuff like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about to this kingdom of God. What difference would it make if you died right now? Would there be one more person die lost if you died right now? How much difference have we made, folks? You know, I, me and Lee was talking the other night. I said, you know, sometimes you look back and you wonder, have I even made a difference anywhere? Well, uh, of course we have. You know, James talking the other day about uh, his boss being sick, his boss's boss being sick. See, I was paying attention, James. And they asked for James to come and pray. And his boss asked him, did you pray? And a teacher over there uh, calls him, what is it, the, the godly man? The holy man? He's making a difference, you see. People are seeing his witness, his light is shining in the place he works. And no doubt, a lot of days he's there and thinks, I'm making no difference at all. Uh, but he is, folks. That's, that's getting a hold of somebody. Somebody is seeing that light and that witness. But I'm asking the rest of us tonight, what kind of a difference are we making? You know, are we so wrapped up in 
everything that we got going on. Oh, I had the worst day at work. Oh, all oh, this has happened. Oh, I've had a little bit of a, a cold. My nose been stopped up all week. You know, whatever. I've had all these things coming against me. Uh, folks, let's just be honest tonight. Uh, we have not done what God has commanded us to do because we don't have a love for God uh, like we should have tonight. We don't love Him uh, like we should. And we don't realize the price that He's paid for us. Uh, and we don't realize the, the value of that lost soul out there. We're supposed to be in the kingdom, you see. I know the world is turned upside down. I know the economy's in the toilet. I know there's sickness. I know there's drugs. I know there's perversion. I know there's everything in the world going on. But still, mingled in all that society where everything is going on, there's supposed to be a, supposed to be a people that's rose above that. You see, uh, there's supposed to be a people uh, that, that should have the spiritual bulletproof vest on tonight, uh, so that no matter what hits us, we still stand. Uh, so that no matter what comes our way, uh, we can still show the joy of God tonight. Uh, so that when the world comes against us, we can say, "Look, world, uh, fight all you want to, do your best." because I'm not going to fail. I'm not going to turn my back on an Almighty God tonight. I'm going to stand because He that's within me is stronger than the one that's in the world. Uh, what am I tonight if I can't overcome the world? Amen. Amen. Amen? Am I not just the world if I don't overcome the world? These men, Paul and Silas, they're thrown in a prison. And still they make a difference. You know, Lee talking the other day about when he has done wrong there. Made a difference in that place. Maybe you're not where you'd like to be tonight. You know? Maybe things just ain't exactly how they'd be if you could have planned them yourself. But that's the place God's got you tonight, and that's the place that He wants you to make a difference. But what difference do we make, folks? I mean, how important are we? I said down here Sunday, the devil don't fight most of us because we don't threaten him. You know? Right. What does he care what we do? We're not doing anything against him. He's going to spend his time fighting the man and woman that's truly working for God. That's who he's going to fight. You know? The TV preacher says, if you got problems... You're out of the will of God. But the Bible says that if you don't have problems, you're out of the will of God. Who am I going to believe tonight? The Bible, maybe? The word of the actual Word of God? Listen, they, they made a difference here. That you read over, I'm trying to hurry, I know you guys are looking wore down, but Acts 5.15, he says, "...insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them." Well, we talk about that all the time here in this church. Uh, but here comes Peter walking down the street, and they lay their sick and lame out on the sidewalks or whatever they got, uh, just so the shadow of him can can pass over their sick and lame, uh, that they might be healed, folks. Do you know why they done that? Because Peter had made a difference, because he had left such an impression on people, and because he had the power of God abiding in him so strong. You see, I know everybody here is probably thinking right now, but Peter denied Jesus. Yeah, he did, and he learned a valuable lesson and never done it again, folks. Uh, listen, but because he was not willing to compromise because of that valuable lesson, uh, because he wouldn't deny Christ anymore, folks, uh, because he was never willing to give in no matter what the world threw at him, uh, he was able to make a difference. He was able to leave uh, such an impression that people wanted uh, just his shadow to pass over people. Listen, Acts 8.12, it says, But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Well, it don't say nothing about them being baptized while they was trying to figure out whether or not to believe Philip. It don't say that, does it? What's it say? And when they believed Philip, 
They believed Him. They believed Him. You know, I had the chance to, to teach one of the Bible school lessons back there. And I said, you know, I've never drunk a drop of alcohol in my life. I've never tasted of it. Nike was probably the strongest stuff I've ever tasted of, and I didn't care for it, I'll just tell you. But I said, you know, if I hang a Budweiser sign on my porch, everybody will think I'm a drunk. Philip here was believable because he had the life of God in him. Because he did not compromise. Because he wouldn't in and out. Because he didn't preach the gospel on good days and hole up somewhere in a motel room on bad days. You know? I don't know. You know? Uh, he never... You don't see where he turned anybody away. Nobody ever come to him and said, Look, Philip, i got a problem. I really need to talk to you. And Philip replies, Look, man, I'm just having a bad day. I'll call you tomorrow. You know? Uh, that never happened. You see, he was always ready and willing uh, to do the work of God. And he was always instant, in season and out of season. Uh, you remember the... Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch there. The Bible says uh, he comes down through there in a chariot. He's reading Isaiah over there. Uh, and it says that God spoke to Philip and he ran and joined himself to that chariot. Now, if it had been one of us sitting there that day, uh, as that chariot passed by, we'd have probably said, Lord, uh, if he comes back this way, we'll talk to him. Uh, you let me see. Let me run into him again uh, in a day or two. And you see if I don't talk to him, Lord. Uh, listen, that man could have died lost due to lack of understanding had Philip not been in Instant in obedience to God. Amen? It says in, in Luke 19.11, it says, And as they heard these things, He added and spake a parable because He was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should appear immediately. Well, Christ is teaching on the kingdom. And He's teaching in such a way that they think the kingdom could appear immediately. Right then, immediately. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Occupy. Well... <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm having fun if nobody else is. I, I'm liking this, you know? This, he tells them to occupy until he comes. Alright, let's play a game here for me. Let's just pretend that we're in an earthly kingdom. Say so we're in the kingdom of Red Lick. And there's a king of this kingdom, obviously, or else it wouldn't be a kingdom, right? Everybody catching on to that? Well, let's just say, for example that our king of Red Lick runs over to Richmond to the grocery store. He's gone from his kingdom, alright? Is it still a kingdom while he's gone? Absolutely. He's still the king. Whether he's uh, sitting smack dab in the middle of it or, or out of town somewhere, he's still the king and this is still a kingdom, folks. Uh, he tells us to occupy till he comes. Uh, what are we supposed to be occupying tonight but the kingdom of God? Uh, we're supposed to be occupying a kingdom here on this earth. We're supposed to be showing forth a, a peculiar people, uh, people not like everybody else. Listen, I, I know everybody else is miserable, but I'm telling you what, not, uh, they've got good reason to be miserable. You see, they're lost and undone. Uh, they don't know God. They might serve some false God. I don't know what it is tonight, uh, but they're lost no matter how you, you weigh it tonight. Uh, they don't have anything to look forward to, and they've got good reason to be miserable. What's your reason? You know? What about you? That's what the. I know I'm <laughs> preaching out of a, a little book here tonight, but that's the title of his chapter here, which is one paragraph. What about you? What's your reason tonight to be miserable? Listen to this. I'm about done here. Luke 23:50. He says, "And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just." The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate 
and begged the body of Jesus. He says that he waited. He waited for the kingdom of God. You see, he's probably one of the ones that was standing when Jesus said, some of you won't see death until you see the kingdom of God. So he's waiting. He's waiting. Waiting for this kingdom. When does it come? Well, let me read you one more verse. Whoever's going to sing, get us a song. Luke 17, 21, he says, Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, is that not good? Behold. Let's look at that word behold for just a second. Do you know what behold means? Behold means, and this is just my definition. I didn't go to my great spiritual source Webster's tonight. But behold is, it would be like me saying, look up here. Look at this. You can see it. You, it's there. There's evidence of it. Behold. Look. Behold. The kingdom of God is within you. Where is this kingdom tonight? Is it far away up in heaven? No. <laughs> it's not. It's not there, folks. Is it in Israel? No, it's not. The kingdom of God is within you tonight. If you be born again, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, being part of a kingdom of God, what difference have you made tonight? And what difference are you making? I mean, listen to the questions he asked. Let me read that again. What have you done with your born again experience? What have you done with your baptism in the Spirit? What have you done with your life since God healed your broken body? What have you done with the exceeding great and precious promises of God? What have you done for a world ripening for the harvest? What about the 1.5 billion souls who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ? The whole world is waiting for the demonstration of the kingdom of God. Now, what about you? Listen, you think back you say, I can't make a difference. Listen, just about every time that God brought great revival or deliverance or whatever it was, He used one person to do that just about every time. You know? Look at Noah. You know, that, that soldier's message I mentioned there, he's talking, he's quoting a man named Bishop Washington out of New York up there. And he says that uh, Bishop Washington says that Noah was the greatest preacher that ever lived. But only eight souls got on that boat, folks. And most of us would be thinking, Lord, if I preach to the whole world and only eight of them saved, I'm a big failure, you see? But he says that Noah is the greatest preacher that ever lived. Why? Because those that didn't get saved, he damned, folks. Listen, he got everybody. Nobody escaped at least the opportunity for salvation. Look at Moses. One man goes down into Egypt and says, Pharaoh, let my people go. How many of us would do that? Can you imagine how your knees would be knocking? Standing in front of the Pharaoh of Egypt, just you with a stick, folks. I mean, come on, you know. Stand there, Pharaoh, let my people go. Jonah, 600,000 people is the estimate of the number of people down there in Nineveh. He went down there slightly unwillingly, of course, but 600,000 people turned to God. One person, folks. One person. Look at the difference Paul made. One man. Oh, yeah, I know. God gave him the bed of roses and all the riches, right? No, wait. He stoned him to death a few times and had him thrown out the city. But still, look what a difference Paul made. We preach more of Paul's writing today than anything else in the Bible. 2,000 years gone by and we're still reading you what Paul wrote. I mean, look tonight. Ask yourself, what difference am I making? You know, I mean, this church can be great, folks. I know it can. I believe that with all my heart. I believe God's got a great plan for this church. But I'll tell you where that's going to start. That's going to start with every single one of us. One at a time. Making a difference. How many of us are completely just sold out to God tonight? 
I mean, just examine yourself tonight. I mean, do what God bids you do, but let's all stand. Pray tonight. What about you?